Okay, here we go. Greetings and good afternoon to all. Thank you for accepting our invitation to this webinar title, The Future of Online Course Design and AI Assisted Human Driven Model. With speakers today, hopefully, Professor King Estes, Senior Instructional Designer and Dr. Arturo Osuna, who is already with us, e-learning instructional designer, and both are from Tarran County College Connect Campus, located in Fort Hayes, Texas, US. Thank you all for your valuable collaboration with this initiative that, as usual, aim to provide special support to member institutions as part of his mission to promote a integration of technology into education. And definitely this topic is very pertinent um, and definitely help us in, in that sense. Today, we have more than 350 people uh, registered from more than 20 higher education institutions in Puerto Rico and another 15 institutions in the US and also organizations like Internet Society in Puerto Rico as well are joining us. We already have connected more than 100 and we are expecting more. I see that we have other people joining us. So thank you all, greeting to all, and we hope that this webinar will be of a great benefit to everyone. As usual, before we start the webinar, we always... Uh, like to share a few things or a few uh, announcements. Uh, to benefit from this webinar, please use the chat to share your questions and comments. I always paying attention to the chat, so don't worry. Although you don't have the audio available to unmute yourself, I will be paying attention to your questions and comments and interrupt Arturo if it's something that needs clarification during the presentation. If not, at the end, we will have a Q&A session uh, around five to 10 minutes so you can share uh, your questions and comments. Also, please use this uh, for your convenience. Also, it's important to see that you have in the in, in the in the in the soon uh, features are available in english uh, the closed captions so you can activate those if you would like to have the captions for this and keep always your microphone on mute to avoid interruptions. We use the feature that when you enter is already mute, but please make sure stay mute during the whole presentation to avoid any interruptions since we are recording this webinar. Also, what someone asked me about is to fill out the form for the certificate. Remember that when you register, not necessarily means that you participate on the webinar. So that's why we, put either a link on the chat, uh, you can see the link on the chat and click there and uh, submit your information to receive the certificate of participation. This is the only way to know that definitely you were at the webinar or you can use your mobile and scan uh, Bella, this QR code in order to submit your information. Please make sure that your email and your name is correct. So you will receive your certificate without any uh, uh, any problems. And also please allow head staff to have at least one at the most two weeks to send the certificate because it's a lot of people who requested and we need to process that in order to send everyone everyone's certificate. Also, uh, please help us spread the word and, and help us invite others to participate in our webinars. We invite you to the next events and webinar uh, in heads in the main page. You will see the next events uh, are showcased there. Next one's going to be as soon as tomorrow. Tomorrow is a Friday, 22nd of September. It's going to be the same time, 3 from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern time or Puerto Rico time. It's gonna be through soon. You just need to register. And this time we're gonna be talking about Introducción al Diseño y Evaluación del Aprendizaje en la Era de la Inteligencia Artificial. And we are so happy to have again, Dr. Jose Ferrer from Europe, eh, Universidad de Puerto Rico in Mayagüez. Also, we would like to highlight that the Heads Online Journal, which is our peer review 
journal is uh, the deadline to submit your articles will be next Friday, Saturday, uh, September, excuse me, 29. So you still have time to submit your article and share your expertise with our global audience now that our journal is uh, accessible from an, an editorial platform. So please don't miss this opportunity. If you need additional days, please contact us and we will definitely can be flexible about it. Also, the next webinar is gonna be in English as well. Uh, as this one is about accessibility, you are in the driver's seat and it will be offered by Professor Lindsay Foster, uh, also a colleague from Arturo. She's an instructional designer, uh, designer excuse me, as well from Tarrant County College Connect Campus. And that's going to be in October 26th. It's going to be a Thursday like today from 3 to 4. Remember that you just need to register a uh, totally free of charge to participate and receive the link uh, to connect. Also, we would like you uh, to help us sharing these invitations with your students. This is going to be a, a summit. It's called the Zoom. It's this, a, excuse me, it's going to be uh, the Zoom is a student's experience summit with a lot of not only institutions that will be showcasing their academic offerings, but also they will have experiential pavilions and concurrent workshops. That's going to be November 14 and 15 at the Convention Center in Puerto Rico. And we are also inviting heads member institutions in the U.S. and also in Latin America to come and join us and also so offer a Bella showcase their academic offerings to our Puerto Rican students. So please help us sharing these opportunities with your students, including this webinar in Spanish that's going to be in December 1st at, about uh, leadership. So uh, we definitely would love your help to helping us sharing this with your students and also you are invited to joining us as well. Always, I mentioned this uh, uh, access to the Peterson test spread where you can find scholarship also uh, students and anyone can practice tests like the PCAT, LSAT for law school, GRE, NCAT for, uh, uh, from medicine school and that among too many others practice tests and also they can download the ebooks to practice uh, to get prepared for those tests and also they can find scholarships since uh, from the uh, community college to either master and doctor's degree and those scholarships are be besides the FAFSA that is the most popular one what they do in this database is they put together or or the organizations foundations and everyone who go who give money for for higher it and you can find there all these opportunities so please help us help us helping us promote this so your students know about these services and it's very easy you just log in or or no excuse me not log in just visit the heads.org page look in the student placita for the peterson and test prep link and then look for the name of your institution and put the code if you don't know the code of your institution please send us an email with the name of your institution so you, we can give you that. And also, besides this uh, Peterson test spread, we also have the Peterson career spread, and this is more focused on to, um, to searching for jobs, internships, create your resume, and find career advice among other services, and they is the same. You just go to heads, Click on the Peterson Career Prep and look for the name of your institution. And if you don't have the code, send us an email. If you don't see the name of your institution, also you can send us an email and we can uh, figure it out how to give you access. That means that your institution is not a member of HES yet, and we can you can also help us uh, to see how we can make this a possibility. Now we are ready to to start our webinar, but first we would like to read a brief summary of 
Uh, Arturo, we're gonna start with Arturo since we don't we are not sure if Kim will be able to join us. But anyway, I will uh, I will read her bio as well. But with Arturo, let me tell you this is a brief summary since he have a, a very vast experience uh, and background. Arturo has a wide variety of experience in higher education, including faculty and staff development, curriculum development, instructional design, is a, and online instruction. He is equity focused and is an advocate for professional growth and lifelong learning. And Arturo earned a bachelor's of science degree in information system from the University of Texas at Arlington and a master of business administration degree from the University of Phoenix, Las Colinas campus. Recently, he's earned his Doctor of Education degree from Southern Methodist a University with his dissertation study, explore institutional and intrinsic factors that impact faculty participation in OER development. Uh, also, let me share a very brief, brief summary of Kim. Kim is a 25-year veteran of public education and currently a senior instructional designer for Tarrant County College, Canet Campus. She was awarded uh, instructional, uh, excuse me, she was awarded secondary teacher of the year for 2020 for Cleburne ISD. And in her 14 years with them, she assisted with the adoption and rollout of instructional technology delivery, uh, professional development for instructors and administrators and supervise a team of learning technology coaches who provide instructional support district wide. Keen is a Google certificate trainer and the 2015 TCA EA, excuse me, Instruction and Technologies of the Year. Kim is passionate about the role of technology in instruction and learning and, and learning and has presented at a local, regional, state, national, and international level. She holds several certifications, including a Master Teacher of Technology and has her principal certification and holds a master degree in curriculum and instructional instruction with an emphasis in technology education and a master degree in educational technology leadership leadership she's currently pursuing her doctor degree in instructional system design and technology through the sum a uh, houston university uh, on a personal note Keen is a proud wife of a retired Navy chief, the blessed mother of six children. Oh my God, how she made it. <laughs> and the delighted grandmother to five adorable grandchildren. Uh, I hope that King can join us. Uh, if not, I know he will. she will be very well represented by Dr. Arturo. Arturo, go ahead. I'm gonna stop my presentation so you can share yours. And thank Excellent. you. Thank you, everyone. The ones who just entered, welcome and go thank ahead. You. Thank you for the uh, great introduction. I believe Kim is here. Uh, oh, really? I think she is. She, she sent Excellent. me a message and said she's here. Yes, there okay. she is. Okay, okay great. So, Kim, let me make you a uh, co host so you can be. Let me look for your name because we have already 130 people. Uh, Kim. But in the meantime, Arturo, please share. Yep. You have the presentation, I guess. Let me share. Yep, I will King. share so the she, screen here. So King will be able to <clears throat> unmute herself. King, where are you? So her name is right like this, Bella right? King. Kim Estes. Okay, perfect. I'm getting yes. there. Okay, King, I see you now. Okay, King. Let me please check your. Check your audio, Kim, if you can. And All right, video. can you hear me okay? Oh, uh, yes, we do. Wonderful, uh, wonderful. We can see you, though. There we uh, go. Now, <laughs> thank you. I'm glad you made it. Thank yes, you so thank much. You. I'm going to put myself on mute. If you don't mind, so one half a question, I will interrupt very briefly. We okay. have uh, until please make sure to leave at least five to ten minutes for a Q and A session at the at the end. So go ahead. 
Thank you so yeah, much so, for your time. So we're going to go blazing fast because we've got a lot that we usually cover in, in these sessions. Uh, so uh, um, in, as in the introduction, you know, we mentioned that, um, you know, our work is with uh, Tarrant County College and part of what we do there is uh, instructional design, right? We build online courses. We're part of the online campus. So we're uh, TCC Connect campus. And, and so uh, as part of the work that we do there, uh, we, we uh, started working through creating um, essentially a model for what AI was gonna look like uh, within our field. And so our session today will be partly why we're doing this, how, you know, what our philosophy is. And then uh, I'm gonna give you sort of a pseudo walkthrough of what uh, AI assisted uh, instructional design looks like uh, that's that's human driven, uh, which is essentially our approach for AI assisted. Kim, is there anything you wanna add to that? Nope, I think you covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so go ahead, Kim. Okay, so a few of the things that we're gonna cover um, today are some of the assumptions and expectations um, that, that are centering around um, language learning models and what we're gonna cover today. I'm gonna give you a little institutional context to how did TCC Connect Campus fall into using AI as part of our design process, um, some of the benefits and limitations of AI, um, why we would want to use AI in assisting learning design and some considerations if you do decide to take that leap. Um, we're going to show you the TCC Connect AI assisted model and Arturo is going to give you some side by side um, on that to show you what it looks like compared to faculty work, which is really exciting. Um, and then he's going to give you that demonstration of the AI assisted learning design. And it's worth it to stay to the end because when you get there, you're going to get a copy of our prompting guide that will help you use a lot of what we use when we design um, if you decide to get into language uh, to large language models and using AI to help you design. So. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for telling that you can send us a PDF of the presentation so we can share not only the recording, see, but also the presentation. So thank Absolutely. you so much for uh, clarifying this, thank you. Absolutely, so we, we like to start these sessions with some sort of assumptions and expectations. Uh, and, and the reason we do this is because uh, sort of the language around AI is used interchangeably and we want to be sort of specific about what we're talking about, the assumptions that we're making as we're moving forward. Uh, so these are sort of our truths and what you can expect from us uh, as we talk about, um, you know, large language models uh, and the use of them in the context of learning design. So um, I think uh, it goes without saying, but I we're saying it uh, just to be clear, <laughs> right? Uh, we have to continue to be critical of anything that's AI generated, right? And so the work that we do sort of accounts for that, right? Uh, in essence, these models, uh, these early iterations of, of, of models are, are language models, right? They're not logic models, they're not knowledge models, they're language models. And so we have to uh, be critical of anything that it outputs because it's not outputting with the idea that it's knowledgeable. It's outputting with the idea that it's good at language, right? And so, anything that it, that we build with with this model, with the with with the current generative AI tools that we have available to us, uh, we have to be critical. Um, this session is really about providing sort of a, an approach to learning design. We're not saying this is the way to do things, but we're sort of giving you what we've sort of come up with, right? As as we've uh, gotten our hands dirty with uh, with AI and as we've sort of figured out how it may impact our role as instructional designers, uh, this is sort of our approach, right? And so it's not the approach, but we just wanted to showcase our approach. And um, I think the other part of that is that these tools, what we found is sort of in general, uh, these AI tools are best utilized in knowledgeable hands, right? And so if you're building with these tools, it's important to know what something about what you're building um, and, and have um, some knowledge around the subject areas and the, and the expertise that you're asking AI to assist you with. Um, I think that we are sort of in agreement uh, and we're moving forward with the assumption that um, 
AI is going to fundamentally change sort of how we design instructional experiences, right? Whether it's using a model like ours, or as these models become more sophisticated, there are going to be tools that sort of change how we do things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we won't be designing courses the same, um, you know, even this year than we did, uh, you know, three years ago. And, and part of that is because of how AI works and what AI can do for us uh, and assist us with uh, through this process. Uh, another assumption is that, um, so when I, when I use the term AI, really what I'm talking about in this context is generative text um, tools, right? So uh, the most common is uh, ChatGPT. So when I'm saying AI in this context, I'm not talking about AI as sort of the whole, you know, in machine learning and all that. I'm really talking about the tools that are more, um, uh, that are more educator uh, based and accessible like ChatGPT or Claude 2 or Bard. So uh, I'm really talking about generative text AI in this context specifically. Um, you know, in other contexts is when we're talking with faculty about the use of AI, we may talk about generative image AI, but in this case, it's really generative text AI. Uh, so when I say AI, I'm using that term sort of interchangeably with that. Um, I think um, we really have and are presented with an opportunity as educators to help shape effective design for future generations within our institution and, and re really within our field as learning designers, right? And so as we've moved forward, we've, we've sort of introduced a model or we're going to introduce a model to you. We expect that this model is going to change, but we are taking the opportunity to go, how, how are we gonna shape what we do in a way that we find is ethical and preserves the roles that we think are important in this process of learning design. And, and, and so essentially our model, uh, you know, is a reflection of what we value, right? And so what we hope to present to you today is an, an AI integration model uh, in the field of learning design that really preserves established human roles in, as of learning designers and subject matter experts. And, and we're doing this because we believe that these roles still hold value in this process, but we're also um, being very honest about how these roles may change. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that as we move forward. So I wanna just give um, the group of really, and we're gonna take just like a minute to do this because again, we want, we've got a lot of cover. So um, if, if you'll just based on this question in the chat, just type in A, B, C, or D, as far as your experience in utilizing AI in learning design. So AI in any kind of learning design, if you've done, um, you know, any of it, um, we, we wanna hear and sort of get a sense of of the audience and your experience with AI in learning design. I see, when well, I guess you can see the chat, right? I see a lot of B, yes. A, C. Okay, great. Okay, excellent. Okay. Arturo, if you can see to the camera. Lots of Bs, a, a few As. If you can see to the camera D's. and key in as well, so we can take a picture without you talking, the two of you. No, you just turn. Can you see? Okay. Okay. Perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. Continue, yeah. continue. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we didn't have Kim before. Okay. A's, Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. So so some of you have gone and, and have and have done some of this work. And um, and then some of you have um have not so it's a it seems like a good mix excellent okay so that's good to know that we have a good mix all right well i'm going to pass it on to kim and she's going to talk about why we sort of chose um ai assisted uh human driven design for tarrant county college so 
In our college, we create courses for our faculty to use called peer developed courses. We have subject matter experts who work with our designers on our team to build these courses. And then we share them through our LMS to all of the instructors in our district. We have six uh, campuses in our district. So we share them outside of just Connect, which is the online campus. Um, and we were finding um, it was taking more than uh, 18 weeks to 20 weeks to build a course. Um, we were having issues when you get a lot of people together who have very strong opinions about what should be included in their courses. We were seeing that it was taking a lot of time to reach consensus. People were struggling making um, making deadlines, that sort of thing. Um, we had issues with making uh, making sure that what we were doing was aligning with district uh, learning outcomes that were provided in our district syllabi, and making sure that we had accessibility compliance, making sure that we were QM rubric aligned. Quality matters is something that our campus and our district use to um, verify the, the quality and the alignment of our courses. So we were running into a lot of issues um, creating courses with that, and it was taking quite a bit of time. We had some very high expectations for our courses. They must include regular, regular and substantive interaction. For those of you not familiar, um, RSI uh, is something that the DOE put forward and that they clarified in uh, June of 2021. Um, financial aid money for online courses is tied to regular and substantive interaction. So you have to make sure that you're meeting those requirements from the DOE or they can rescind your financial aid for those courses. Um, educational resources were available to our faculty that they were not aware of. We wanted to make sure that we had high quality um, educational resources. So we looked at OER. In fact, Dr. Azuna is running one of our own, um, our very first uh, textbook build. We're building our own OER textbooks at TCC Connect as well. We have an instructional designer for accessibility to make sure that we are not just meeting but exceeding WCAG standards for accessibility so that when we turn out a course from Connect, it comes out of the gate um, accessible for our students and our faculty to use. Um, and then we have an incredible number of uh, course timelines, 16 week, 12 weeks, 10 weeks, seven week, eight week, five week, monthly start, winter semester, spring semester. Um, there's a lot. Um, and so we needed to be able to take a course and adjust the, the, um, the outline of the course so that it would fit in that timeline. And we're also interested, um, we're, we're really blessed to have leadership that are interested in new and innovative approaches. Um, Arturo is our instructional designer um, who focuses on innovation. So he's bringing OER, he's bringing AI and bringing in tools that are not just innovative because they're cool and shiny, but are innovative because they improve the work they improve the learning environment or the design of the courses, um, that they free up the time to focus on students, students learn, student learning, instruction, um, and, and uh, innovate in ways that make that happen. So that's sort of how we got into AI, especially with the peer developed courses and trying to speed that process up to get those courses out. Um, and you'll get to see a little example. I don't want to give away too much because Arturo has a phenomenal example of what that looks like. So I'll end it there and then we'll tease it a little bit and you can see how he um, he used AI with uh, peer developed courses in a minute. Okay. So, um, Arturo, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So, we want to just briefly talk about what we found uh, are sort of the benefits of AI in general, right? Especially, uh, again, when we're talking about generative uh, text, is that you know, AI can assist learning design in really these ways, uh, you know, brainstorming, summarizing, uh, you know, organizing our thoughts and our concepts uh, really uh, made a big difference in how we develop simulations for learning and, and, uh, and then how we've even evaluated materials. And we're gonna show you sort of the prompting, uh, the prompting tools that we provided for these kinds of things. Um, but what, what we've also found is that there's challenges associated to, um, oh, sorry, there's challenges associated or limitations to AI, right? Um, you know, AI isn't culturally aware, right? Uh, we know that there's a lot of bias when it comes to, or potential bias when it comes to AI output, right? Uh, we also know that uh, it's, it's not pedagogically aware, right, um, by default. So any output that's um, that's being provided by uh, these um, models uh, isn't isn't outputting it with learning in mind, and so that's something that as designers we have to be cognizant of. Um, and the other part about uh, the output is that because it's a language model, they're really really confidently 
biased and in some cases confidently incorrect, right? And so they, um, if you're unaware and if you're not knowledgeable about the subject matter, um, you can be quickly fooled essentially by uh, these models, right? And so these are just things that, uh, you know, that we've observed in using these models and that we wanna make you aware of uh, as you think about what this integration looks like for you as educators and as designers. So Kim, you're mute. You're on mute. Now I'm muted. That's yeah. going to be the phrase of the century. You're muted. Um, so looking at this, why AI assisted learning design, right? Why an AI assisted learning design model? And um, basically it refers to the use of artificial intelligence technologies to support and enhance the process of designing learning experiences. So the goal of AI assisted learning design is to make the process of designing effect, uh, designing effective learning experiences more efficient, more effective, more personalized, right? By leveraging the power of AI to assist the learning designer. And again, it's assisting, not taking the place of, right? Because you still need that human discernment that comes. And you need somebody who has um, some expertise in that area to be able to tell when we get some of that confident bias or that confident incorrectness. So we're really looking at that kind of, of efficiency, effectiveness, and, and speeding up that process and helping the, the designer. Yeah, there we go. So we've been working, um, AI prompting is more effective when prompted by experts in learning design or subject matter experts. Um, and it should be peer reviewed, right? There should be a process where you look over that work. How many times have you been working on something in the office, right? And you turn to your neighbor and go, mm, I've been staring at this a long time. I think this is good, but will you look at it and give me some feedback? You have to do the same thing when you're prompting an AI. Um, and Arturo, you usually have a lot to add to this part about um, the expert prompting. Do you wanna throw some stuff in here on that? No. <laughs> oh yes, my God. Abs That's gonna absolutely. Take <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I, so um, I, I think part of, of what, I, what we've been mentioning before, right, is because uh, AI can be so confidently uh, incorrect, you know, we found that uh, prompting is most effective when, when you're, when you're uh, an expert, right? either an expert in learning design or a subject matter expert or both, right? And our process sort of um, sort of uh, encompasses that, right? And, and, and accounts for it as part of, of what we're trying to accomplish, which is, which is what this next sort of, uh, of image sort of drives home, right? This idea that there's this synergy between, you know, we're taking this user-centered approach to design where AI sort of assists us both as learning designers and as subject matter experts and just sort of partners uh, as, a, as a primary tool. Perfect. Okay, there we go. And then um, actually, I think you hit all of that. Uh, I did. I'm sorry. Yeah, you did. I I'm did. going through my notes going, yep, you got that, you got that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and one thing that we do talk about um, is that the, the learning designer is gonna see a shift in their role to becoming a prompt engineer. I think um, what we're seeing a lot um, with this model is that as learning designers, our team is having to really learn how to prompt well. And we're really fortunate um, to have Arturo because he gets in there and tests that stuff out like crazy. Um, but you're going to have to learn how to ask for what you need in a language model that works for AI to understand and to give you that content out that's gonna be in the format that you need, um, that's going to have all of the language that you need, um, it's really important that as learning designers, we really start to understand how AI works so that we can leverage that tool. I think you're gonna start seeing that this is gonna start showing up um, in job, I've already seen it. It's showing up in, in ID job descriptions that you're an AI prompter as well, because they're using AI, they see the value in, in the efficiency and the effectiveness of getting content built um, in, in alignment. So it really, I think one of those things we talked about how roles can shift, I think the role of the, the learning designer really is going to shift into also being the prompt engineer of the project when you're working with SMEs to build courses and to build learning, uh, learning environments. Yep. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through this quickly or Kim, you're going to go through this quickly. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Because we want to make sure we get to the to the to the next part. Absolutely. So you, we 
when computers came out, we talked a lot about information literacy, right? And digital literacy, not just for our students, but for our faculty. Y'all are lucky because I talk really fast. Here I go. So one thing we really need to start talking about is AI literacy. This is not going away. The horse is out of the barn. You can't shut the door and just catch everybody cheating and make it go away. We've really got to embrace this because it's not going away. We've got to understand it and we've got to become AI literate. So it's really important as designers that you take classes, that you get some understanding, watch those videos, talk to people, join events like this. But you need to know that you need to start practicing AI prompting as a designer, as a faculty member, as an administrator. You need to really critically evaluate the AI tools and outputs. Right now, the number one blog post is top 10 new AI tools. Well, that's great. Are any of them worth anything? You've really got to use your discernment to know what tools are out there. What are they intended to do? How well backed are they? What are their privacy and security um, issues? That sort of thing. You need to think about how you can integrate those tools effectively, not only for your design related tasks, but your personal tasks, right? If you, if you get to use something personally, you start to see how that leaks over into your work realm and vice versa, right? And then you need guidance for prompting for your specific discipline. So if I'm a chemistry teacher, I really need to be looking at how I can integrate AI prompting to get what I need in a chemistry learning environment, which is different from uh, an English comp, which is different from a language class, which is different from a nursing class or a real estate class, right? We got to look at corporate as well, right? We have corporate designers as well. So you really need to look at what kind of prompting, what kind of language do you need to be using for your specific disciplines? And then for the design workflow, right? Are we aligning? Are we building content? Are we um, assessing? What are we doing so that you get that? And all of that comes as part of that AI literacy that we have as designers have got to start cultivating for ourselves. All right. So we should be um, designing activities that align with our learning outcomes. We need to leverage what AI does well, which is creating content and pulling things together, but we also need to manage what it doesn't do well. We need to, again, be looking for that confident incorrectness and checking it. You can't just spit something out in chat GPT or Bard and copy and paste it in, right? You've got to read it, you've got to understand it, and you've got to make sure that it's appropriate. Um, you want to model for your students, if you're a faculty member or a designer, model for your faculty, um, the appropriate and ethical uses of these tools. Right. Um, we actually, Arturo and I served on the committee that wrote the syllabi statements for our campus for AI use. And we gave our faculty three options. You can't use it. You can use it, but only where I say you can use it and you can use it all the time. And here's how you cite it. So um, really making sure that you're modeling ethical use of AI. Let people know when you're using it. Right. Have a standard statement. Uh, you know, uh, content from this course was assisted by AI and and you know, corrected by human or human driven, we say AI assisted human driven. Um, you need to look at AI assisted models um, that will kind of, the use of AI assisted models are going to kind of necessitate a shift where content um, origination is going more towards the learning designers and the subject matter experts are becoming editors. So, um, and we'll show you an example of what this looks like, but when you're working with a subject matter expert in chemistry and as a designer, I have it come up with a list of course um, course objectives based on the syllabus learning outcomes, um, that's something that an SME who teaches chemistry can look at and go, this one is good, but this one is not. And you need to rely heavily on that content area expertise. And as a designer, as in your design expertise, when you get that content back, but that's going to kind of shift the role where we're helping to provide content now and the SMEs are more editors. Um, and then it's vital to continue to defer to those subject matter experts for guidance on curricular and subject specific content. They really need to be checking that to make sure that what, what came out of your language model is accurate is um, represented in the best possible way for student learning. You know, that's where that expertise as an SME, AI is never going to replace an instructor. We need those instructors to tell us um, once we get that content, what needs to be fixed to make it accurate and applicable. And then considerations for learning designers. Um, you really want to train to become prompting experts. And Arthur, do you want to talk to this a little bit? Because you have a really great way of kind of expressing this. And I'd, I'd like them to hear you kind of talk about the prompting piece. Oh, still on mute. <laughs> Just leave it on. You're good. Uh, yeah, I know. That's, that's what I should do. Okay. So an SME is a subject matter expert, right? So in, in, the, in the world of instructional design, the, 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 the instructional designers, yeah, typically will uh, develop uh, the structure of a course and the subject matter experts will develop the, the, the content based on their expertise, correct? So, um, and um, 
I think early on institutions are going to rely on learning designers to sort of be the the prompt experts, right? Um, because uh, we're going we're going to be looking at this, you know, because generally, um, you know, instructional designers or, or centers for teaching and learning with instructional designers or or, or groups like us, we're, we tend to sort of lead the charge when it comes to to new developments, and so I think. Um, if you're a learning designer, you really need to be thinking about what that looks like, right? And and train yourself to be a prompting expert and immerse yourself in what prompting looks like, not just text prompting, but image prompting, music prompting, because they're all gonna be at some point applicable to the work that you're doing. Um, and really start to think about, well, what is, how, what is the structure that we're using, our standard operating procedures around learning design? And how does AI fit within that, right? And, and you do that by also setting ground rules, and this is where your ethics come in, right? And, and your institutional uh, goals and values, um, and they should reflect this, right? Um, you know, you have to set clear ground rules about where, where you're gonna use these tools and where you're not going to use these tools, right? And you should be doing that not just as an institution, but as a, as a designer for the institution. You should be thinking about where, where, you're, going, where you're going to incorporate this technology and how you're gonna incorporate it in a way that is ethical and, uh, and accurate uh, and best yeah. serves your students. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is a conversation that may have to happen at your, your district or university or college level so that it's uniform, but it is something that, uh, that needs to happen for sure. Um, when you are a subject matter expert, if you're a faculty member, for example, and you're looking at using AI and designing your courses, you really wanna make sure that you have a good understanding. Again, there's this AI literacy, right? Have a good understanding of good prompting techniques. What prompts work well for your particular use cases? Experimentation is key. Don't just get on, ask one question, and then you didn't get the answer you wanted, so AI is stupid and I'm not gonna use it. You have to go back in and learn how to talk to AI and how to ask for what you need so that you can get that. And there are a lot of people um, out there making a whole lot of videos on how to prompt. There's a lot of prompting guides out there. So there are people who are starting to cash in on that market, right? Um, but you can do that on your own if you want to. Um, but get in and, and get your feet wet and really mess with it so that you can really get a sense of what you're dealing with on the other side of the screen. You need to determine the level of engagement with AI tools that's appropriate for you as an instructor. Some people are way comfortable with this and some people are like, ah! Oh, no, I'm kind of scared. Um, you need to look at how appropriate is AI for your field. If you're teaching social media marketing, real estate, any of that, you need to be in here um, because they're already blogs and 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 Instagram posts and all of that being created by AI right now. This is heavy in the in the marketing field. You also want to think about your students. How much AI use is appropriate in the development of your learning um, environment for your students? Not only by how much you use, but whether or not you're going to ask them to use it as well. Right. And there are ways that you can ask your students to use AI as a learning tool. Um, and it's OK to start small. Right. In anything else, when we introduced technology and everybody went to one to one devices or we had to jump into COVID, you didn't get a chance to start small because everybody jumped on that bandwagon. But it's OK to use AI to fill in need gaps as you're learning. Right. There has to be a learning curve here. Um, and what works for one of you may not work for somebody else. Um, on our own team, we all use AI in different ways. We don't use it the same way. We don't talk to it the same way. And so our prompts get different responses. So um, it's OK uh, to, to find that niche for you, that what works for you as a, as a subject matter expert in your class. Um, but it, it, it is something that you do need to address. I don't think it's something that you can just not address at all. Um, because students are aware of it, everybody's aware of it. So at least addressing it and, and moving forward with some confidence in a direction that works for you is a good idea as a subject matter expert, for sure. So um, we're gonna get deep into this now. So uh, essentially the way, we, the, the way we create online courses at TC Connect is we start with what we call a course map or a course outline. And essentially, uh, the way AI assisted works is that you prompt as, as, as much or as little of that process as required, right? Um, and, and we prompt in steps uh, by order of complexity, uh, uh, detailed required. So we tend to prompt sort of from the broad sense of course design. So like starting with course outcomes, and then we prompt in to lessons, right? So we start at course, then we go into module, then we go into topic and then we go into assessment. And that's typically how we approach learning design in general, 
but that's also how we approach prompting or AI assisted prompting in the work that we're doing. So it's, it's course level, module level, topic level, uh, and then essentially assessment level. Um, and so I'm going to show you what that kind of looks like, right? So, and this is, these are all prompts that I've done in uh, chat GPT. Uh, and this is just an example of something that we've, that we've done. So uh, as part of what, you know, we were sort of studying the, the use case and the, and the, the validity of this process, uh, we essentially took a module, uh, a course that we were already designing with a, with a PDC process. And then, uh, and then I also uh, at the same time started designing this using AI as the subject matter expert as well. So I was the learning designer, subject matter expert. And so this is the way potentially it would look like. So in this case, I've asked uh, AI to write uh, a course outline that includes a lesson title, description, and some topics. And then I've asked it to align to these specific outcomes. So at our institution, we have sort of course level outcomes that are provided as part of a master syllabus for a, any course that we teach. And so essentially I've asked it to, to do that. And then it spit out these lessons, right? With a description, with topics, um, and, you know, and lesson two with a description and topics. And let me show you how sort of similar it was to, uh, so on the right are the 10 lessons that AI generated based on the outcomes and on, um, I'm sorry, on the left, that's that's the AI. And then on the right is sort of the human generated. So this was a team. And this is, these are the lessons they put together. And yeah, so notice Arjo, let, me give them, let me give them a Go little ahead. background. Arturo was actually the lead designer on this peer developed course build. And he that's had correct. four business teachers working. This is a business 1301 course working with him. So while he was building with the human team, he was also using chat GPT as the ID. And since he teaches business 1301 as the subject matter expert. So what you're looking at is that comparative um, list of lessons created by the humans with no idea that he was working in AI. And then what Arturo came up with using AI. Correct. And we so they're pretty similar. <laughs> Absolutely. And they're, they're pretty similar. So as you can see, uh, the, the, the PDC generated group, they broke up human resources, marketing, accounting, they broke those up sort of, uh, and then, you know, over here, uh, these were sort of, uh, ethics were, was, were in several places, uh, you know, forms of, of ownership was its own. Um, and then, uh, information technology and e-business, they both had those. Uh, and so there were some similarities and there were some differences. Uh, in, in, in sort of AI generated versus human generated. Right. So then uh, what I did in, in sort of this scenario is I took this lesson nine, you know, which is just one lesson and one topic. And, and essentially I wanted to build this out, right? So for lesson nine, I said, please write some outcomes. Um, so these are, these are lesson level outcomes, right? Uh, for this lesson. And, and I just took the, the text of that lesson and the topics that it provided. And then these are the outcomes that it that it built out. Now notice that uh, if you're a designer, you'll notice that like um, understand and uh, understand here for two, for three and six are not good outcomes. You never start an outcome with understand. And so these are changes that, you know, essentially I would make as a designer, I would recognize that these aren't good outcomes um, and I would make those changes. The other thing that I noticed is that um, the model also created an outcome, this number seven, develop a plan for implementing ethical practices. So it's already giving you an idea of how you could assess this knowledge. And this is without me prompting it at all. So that, that was pretty impressive for the model to sort of I, identify an, an outcome based on something that you would potentially assess uh, for this lesson. So I'm I decided I'm going to take this uh, identify ethical challenges, um, and I want that I want that to then create or I want the model to then create a list of topics to cover that outcome. Right, so identifying the ethical challenge, and so I I prompted it to write a list of topics, and then these are the topics that it came up with. Right, these nine topics, and so I know that as the expert. I know that ethics, there's a whole chapter on ethics. And so I don't like that first one. Um, 
whistleblowing and ethical reporting mechanism is something that I wouldn't use in this context. Incorporating ethics again, there's a whole there's a whole chapter on ethics, and uh, and so I then as the expert cut out certain aspects of these topics uh, that I found maybe not um, appropriate for this um, for this group. So again, AI is not doing everything for me. I'm assessing it. I'm I'm changing it. I'm uh, identifying things that I wouldn't do as the instructor and I'm making changes, but I'm much faster now because AI is sort of helping me write through some of these challenges, right? And so let's say I, I like this idea of managing ethical dilemmas in the workplace, right? And so I'm essentially taking that um, and I'm asking it to write me some an introductory paragraph on that. So it's written this introductory paragraph that I would then take make some changes to it, add my own context to it. And then that potentially becomes part of the content I use for a lesson um, on that topic. And then um, I've then asked it to write a real world activity for that specific outcome. And it developed this, de uh, developing a social responsibility action plan, right? And so, but it developed it for like a face-to-face -face setting and I teach online. So I thought then I could take aspects of this plan. I really like three here uh, where they develop an action plan. And I really like uh, six as sort of a follow-up discussion. So again, I'm not taking everything that the AI sort of spits out. I'm taking aspects of it and I'm incorporating those, the things that work for me uh, into this process. Um, and then, um, Part of it is is uh, writing it based on a hypothetical. And so I actually ask AI to write me some hypotheticals, right? And so this is one that it just it just created for me, right? So it's got a, a essentially a hypothetical. And that's that simulation part that we were talking about earlier. And then finally, uh, I need to assess this. So I've asked AI to create a rubric to assess the evaluation of strengths and weaknesses of a social responsibility plan. And so essentially it's, uh, it's developed uh, this uh, rubric that I can then incorporate into my learning management system. I can make changes to it. I can be more specific about what I want the rubric to uh, categories to be. But in this case, I just asked it to generate what it thought was important. But I can certainly prompt it and give details and things of that nature. So I, I wanted just to briefly give you sort of the timeline comparison. As, as Kim mentioned, I started developing one module and then we had our group in the traditional method develop a module. Uh, one module took 30 work hours over two and a half weeks in the traditional method. In the method of me working with the AI assisted model, I was able to do the same amount with a comparable lesson uh, in 10 hours over three days. So the comparison is, is, um, is quite stark when you, when you look at it in that way. So uh, certainly more efficient, uh, certainly comparable when it comes to uh, quality of instruction um, and um, two different methods of doing it. Yeah, I'd like to throw in here that um, I've done several peer developed courses with faculty. And one of the things that we notice in, in terms of the time and length is, is reaching consensus. That can be difficult when you have experts in your field and they all have their opinion on what should be in a lesson. I, I will tell you that I had a team that argued for 30 minutes over whether we were going to use dashes or periods in our naming convention. That was 30 minutes we couldn't get back in that design um, process. And I had to nip it in the bud and say, OK, we're done. I'm going to pick one. If you don't like it, you can change it later. But um, but being able to bring in something that is grounded in their content that aligns with their their course objectives and then ask them to tweak it ask them to fix it ask them to add or subtract to it takes significantly less time than asking them to create it from scratch because everybody wants to teach the course that they teach right because that's what they teach and that's what they know and that's what they're comfortable with but getting um ai to put something out there that is a little um less 
uh, faculty specific and a little more content specific, then they can start adding, oh, but I want to teach, I want to add this piece because it's really important when I teach this. And the other SMEs can say, yeah, yeah, that's good. Or maybe we should add that down here. But we have found that it speeds up those conversations and it speeds up the work. And sometimes our, our faculty who have never developed courses, they're a little slow in offering because they're not sure what to, what to offer up. But when you give them a list to look at, they become inspired. That, oh, no, I see. Yes, this, this aligns with the way I teach this class. Let me give you some additional stuff. So we have found that it is really helpful when you can bring that. Um, and so we had a question, Arturo, in this process, who or how do you claim ownership of the content that was developed with the assistance of AI? That's a good question. Um, well, um, so just based on copyright laws, the way they currently sit, uh, anything that's sort of AI generated uh, is open content because it uh, you can't sort of copyright uh, denotes um, human expression and AI is not human expression. So you can't currently copyright AI, right? And so any content that's sort of developed with the use of AI uh, is essentially uh, in a legal standpoint, from a legal standpoint, um, AI is it's, right. uh, open. Mm -hmm. And we are aware that there are people suing um, OpenAI and a couple of others for using their data without permission and that sort of thing. Generally, we will let people know that we are AI assisted, that we have used AI to help build some of the content. We're very transparent about that. In fact, um, we did one presentation and somebody said, did you use AI to help you with this presentation? We we're like, yep, we sure did. Um, you know, we're very open about that, but everything is reviewed, checked, um, added to, subtracted from. It is all... Um, human driven, we do go in and make sure that that content aligns. We do make sure that our, our SMEs are happy with the way the content is being presented, the flow of the of the lessons and the quality of the assessments. Um, and then we have some other quality assurances built in, quality matters, accessibility, that sort of thing, to make sure that we're reading, meeting the rigor standard that we need to be as well. So, um, but we are very transparent that we use AI to help us, absolutely. Um, yes, you're absolutely going to get a copy of this guide. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I'm <laughs> Yes. I'm just going to share that now uh, in the chat. And essentially, this is the uh, AI prompting guide for online course design. Uh, we welcome you to use it and to provide us feedback on it. If there's yes. things that work really well or don't work really well for you, please let us know. Yes, and this is a Google Doc so that we can create this as a living document. Arturo um, adds to this regularly. In fact, if you have a great prompt, we'd love, if you're willing to share, we'd love to add it. Um, but please make, make sure if you do make a copy, know that we will continue to update this document as we learn more and use AI more in design. So you'll want to bookmark and come back and revisit so that you can see the new updates. Absolutely. Excellent. In what basis are you going to do the, I, I guess, annually or per semester? How do you estimate it's going to be the updates um, of the... Right now, Arturo's updating it every time he gets a good prompt. Once he's worked through uh -huh. a prompt, he actually sends the prompt to other members of our team to practice with, to give him feedback, to see if they get the same results that he got, to add um, an offer. That's part of that peer review process. Okay. So um, once he's beta tested that and sort of run that through some other designers, then he'll add that to our prompting guide. Um, so yeah, we try to test it out and make sure that we're pretty consistent across our team before we put something in the guide so that the user will have a similar experience. Okay. So yeah, right Excellent. now it's, we're kind of updating on the fly. Um, <laughs> by the way, I guess in the presentation, you could, you, you will put the link to, uh, to download the guideline, right? Yes. Yeah, we just put it in the chat, but we, if, oh, okay. if you'll, yeah, yeah they and, add it in the presentation because if someone can be able to join us, then they can, in the presentation, they can link there, a, a go to the link and download Absolutely. it. And I, I, we have a question from Dr. Jose Medina, Hola. he said, does it follow the ADI model? So you can actually, um, you can actually ask it to. We didn't put a specific model in there for Addy, but you can actually say using the Addy model and then use any of our prompts and it will follow the Addy model for you. Absolutely. Um, yes, absolutely. Because people use different models and Addy, however, is the most popular. We didn't want to be presumptive and say that everybody had to use the Addy model. So you can actually add just that line using the Addy model and then use any of our prompts and it will follow Addy for you if you're using Addy. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you can and, use and any it's... other design format that way as well. Yeah, and it pretty much does because you know we have a planning phase and a development phase and a, right. so it 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 follows the the sort of the the essence of Addy essentially. Right. 
and, and the nice part about this is you can take any of these prompts and then tweak them for what you need. Um, in fact, Arturo has it very specific. We have a very specific naming structure for our course objectives and our module objectives. And he is actually trained, um, has the prompt that gives us the formatting for the numbering of the objectives the way that we do it at TCC. So you can tweak that and have it actually include the formatting for the way your institution would like to number your module or course objectives as well. So all of this is take it, run with it. It's under Creative Commons license. We don't own any of it. We're sharing all of it. You know, just give us a little credit and then uh, we'll get it loaded up in there. And and if you have, like I said, if you're if you're experimenting and you have a great one and you think it would be helpful to other designers and other faculty, if you send it to us, we'd be happy to, to add it. Well, we're going to run it through the testers here and then we'll add it to the document. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah, I guess, yeah, you have there the Twitter email is right yes. there and Arturo email. So you will have that as part of the presentation when Arturo, can you send it uh, in a PDF format to me? It will be great as soon as possible because as soon as we download the recording, we will be sharing the recording and also the presentation in a PDF format. I just seen in the chat, and I guess you do as well, excellent comments about your excellent and outstanding presentation. So we are so happy that everybody enjoy. Uh, and it says, who say, ah, Kim, that was you. Okay, I, I, that was a question. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. We are running a little bit two, two, two minutes after four here in Puerto Rico, uh, three in, in your area. But since the conversation has been so uh, interesting, we don't want to, uh, to hold this. So any other question? This is the perfect time. If not, we are ready. We are ready to uh, conclude this webinar. Everybody saying thank you to you, Kim. Thank you actually for being here. I know you have a hectic <laughs> agenda and you were trying to, uh, and we really appreciate that you were here. Uh, Maria said what you have just said about the shifting of role is a whole issue on our university too. So definitely uh, everything is very, very common so thank you thank you so much for sharing I, I i just want to make sure okay i see a question here from maria de la paz how do you convince the faculty to be on board with these changes that's a really good question um that really is and actually um we we've been talking to a lot of faculty and we had faculty serving when we wrote the um the syllabi guidelines for when you use AI in the classroom. And there there seem to be two camps, right? There's the, oh my God, block it. We've got to, they're cheating, don't use it. And then we have the, dude, what can we get this to do? We want to use this. And you sort of, we sort of, it's very polarizing, right? What we're trying to do is to make sure that faculty understand and are aware of what AI is and how it can benefit them as instructors. Um, Arturo actually spearheaded a series of five webinars, um, it was four webinars and an AI panel, which we do have recordings of. We did AI for teachers, AI for designers, um, what is AI and the future of AI. And then we had a panel of educators from K-12 all the way through to the private sector. And we talked about AI and where we're going with AI. So we're really trying to educate faculty. I feel like the knee-jerk reactions and the fear comes from a lack of, of education and understanding. Um, I sort of feel like we've gotten calculators all over again. I remember math teachers freaking out when we got graphing calculators. No one's ever going to know how to do math if we use calculators. And now everybody has a calculator, right? So I, I, I think that education is really the way to go. Arturo, break in any time if, if I'm not hitting anything that you want to hit with faculty, especially no, I, since I, you represent our faculty. I agree. I think I think the other aspect is is not just showing them what, what it can do, but what it can't do, right? And, right. And, and, and really sort of trying to have... Um, conversations about the fact that it's not going anywhere right and and mm -hmm. um and so we, we you know in in and there's no easy way to catch you know cheaters right so we've got to really think about how we redefine what cheating is and what it isn't and how we redefine what 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 uh what ethics is in in this new sort of age right, right. which is the same conversation we had when the internet came along right, right. and so i think we're just uh, we're just having it again, and it's right. a, a different tool this time. So and ultimately, it's just, a tool. We just recently hosted a, a couple of gentlemen from Norway who have a, a, a product called Curapod that uses AI, and they were talking to our faculty about the fact that by refusing to allow your students to learn about AI, you're setting them behind and causing an inequity in the in the marketplace mm -hmm. because businesses are looking 
for people who are going to be able to leverage this tool. And by refusing to introduce your students to it and allow them to understand how it functions within your field, you're, you're limiting their ability to leverage this tool. So you've got to figure out where in your field and in the course that you teach, how can this be applicable in the workplace? One of my biggest pet peeves is okay for me, but not for thee. I can use AI to design my course, but you can't use it to take it. And that really is limiting. We're so worried about cheating that we're forgetting to provide experiences and opportunities for students to practice what we're sending them in the workforce to do. So I'm really big about, we've got to stop worrying about cheating and change the way we teach to allow students to explore and expand on these tools and leverage these tools. So we've really got to think about that as educators as well, um, which is not well, always a popular. <laughs> well, Kim, and I think, I think we're also, um, we're also potentially limiting something that students could get excited about, right? Yes. There's, there's new possibilities. Some engagement. With, yes. Right. Some engagement there, which, you know, I, th I think by saying you can't use this new sort of tool, potentially you're you're also uh, disengaging students in 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 a you know in something that they they might find interest in. So absolutely, well, and there are career careers out there right now in AI prompting that are paying six figures. So it's really important that we recognize where the market is shifting, where our students' attention is going to be shifting, um, and and where they're going to want to invest their funds to attend school so they get the degrees that will make them ready for those jobs that they're passionate and excited about. Absolutely. I mean, it, it not just about the engagement, it's also about where do they want to go in their lives and what do they want to do? And are we providing them with the tools they need to do that? Absolutely. Let me to conclude and thank you yes. for this <laughs> enlightenment. Like one of our uh, participants said, I have a question that I don't know why she put it directly to me. So I'm going to read it to you because you're not able to see it. It's from Dr. Norma Ortiz. He says, does your institution have a policy about the AI use uh, or you should have one for every course? We do. And actually, Arturo um, wrote the majority of what our district is using right now. Um, we, we offer guidance for our faculty. We give them three written statements that they can include in their syllabus about the use of AI in their courses. Um, now, this is from the student standpoint, whether students can use it, not at all. And there is an explanation of what that means, whether they can use it only as directed by the instructor. And there's an explanation of what that means. And then whether they can use it throughout the course and how they will have to demonstrate that. Um, it also refers back to our student handbook so that if in the syllabus it says you cannot use AI at all and you use AI, you are in violation of the syllabus, the the, the um, guidelines in the syllabus, and therefore you are in violation of the student handbook in terms of academic honesty, dishonesty. So we do tie it into policy that is already existing in our college. We did not write AI policy because honestly, Using AI when you're told you can't use AI is like using notes on your quiz when you're told you can't use notes on your quiz, right? That's an academic dishonesty issue. And we already have policy at our institution for that. And so a lot of, of institutions are like, do we need an AI policy? But you really already have one. You have an academic dishonesty policy. And as long as your syllabi are clear about what is acceptable and not in a course, you're going to fall under that existing policy. So that's how we wrote that. And we do have those three. And if that's something that you're interested in, if that person is still online, if you email either one of us, we can send you a copy of our institution's policy or our, our institution's guidelines. Sure. Okay. She said, thank you. Thank you, Norma, yeah. for your question that is really important and if we don't have any other question please remember to uh, as I mentioned here in the chat to request your certificate of participation if you want to receive one uh, please click there and then put your name the most important thing is that your email is correct so we are able to send it to you in the next week or the next two weeks, okay? Please allow us at least two weeks since we are kind of busy. Tomorrow, we have another webinar with Dr. Jose Ferrer, but the one from University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, because I saw in the participants that we have another Jose Ferrer, but this one is from ICPR. So <laughs> Jose Ferrer from University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. So any other comments to conclude? Any other question? If not, sorry, we uh, uh, take another 10 minutes, but this topic is so important that we definitely want to invest that time on clarifying from you, there's experts on this topic. So thank you again, Kim, for taking out of your hectic agenda and staying with us and also Arturo for being able to back up if you couldn't be able to and also be there too. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your 
uh, information and certification. And uh, thank you so much. Hopefully see you tomorrow, everyone. The, the, the webinar is, uh, of tomorrow is in Spanish. So all the people who uh, understand Spanish are able to join us and hopefully we see you then. Thank you again, Kim. Thank you again, Arturo. And thank you again to everyone. I'm going to stop the recording. Muchas gracias.